The Night Beat starts right now. Bear County deputies sickened by COVID-19 and even put one of them in a coma. So why are so many deputies being denied COVID benefits? Case had investigates and speaks with the deputy's wife and the sheriff. And honoring the victims in the Uvalde mass shooting, Uvalde City Council speaking with families to determine the next steps. We have a live report coming up. Also tonight, student loans. The White House has planned to erase some of that debt and why it could cause more harm than good. An economic analyst breaks it all down for us. But first. They put their lives on the line to protect the community during a deadly pandemic, but less than a quarter of Bear County Sheriff's deputies who applied for COVID-19 workers' compensation benefits actually received them. KSAT investigates uncovered the stunning figures. The night team's Dylan Collier sat down with one deputy's wife who is imploring the county to do the right thing. <laughs> Deputy Johnny Rodriguez has spent parts of the last four decades proudly serving the Bear County Sheriff's Office, most recently as a West Side patrolman. But in early January, maybe about four you know, hours into a shift, you know, he just was not having it. Rodriguez became one of the nearly 1,200 BCSO staff members so far to test positive for COVID-19. The virus hit him hard. He was hospitalized and then moved to better address his lung issues. Rodriguez spent months in a coma as medical staff told his wife Sharon to prepare for life without him. They told me multiple times every morning rounding, you know, he's not going to make it, you know, to get your financial affairs in order. And I refused to. <clears throat> in March, with Rodriguez still fighting to survive, his wife learned Bear County's third party administrator had denied their claim for income and medical benefits, stating he didn't get the virus during the scope of his employment. The Rodriguez family is not alone. 33 BCSO detention officers and deputies have filed for COVID-19 related workers' compensation benefits since the start of the pandemic. Only eight have been approved, putting the county's denial rate at over 75%. He came to work reported for work, clocked in, did his, his shift. Sheriff Javier Salazar says the Rodriguez denial has stayed in place even after BCSO provided body camera footage showing the deputy at work before he got sick. Salazar's subsequent protests have gone nowhere. It's not enough for you, the sheriff, to be able to go to the county and say, do the right thing. I mean, what are we doing here? Uh, apparently not. Uh, you know, you would think, I, I'm of the same opinion as you, Dylan. Uh, you would think that that would be more than enough. Rodriguez pulled out of his coma and was finally healthy enough to return home in July. He requires around-the-clock oxygen and continues the arduous task of trying to regain the 100 pounds he lost while in the hospital. Whether he'll ever be healthy enough to return to duty remains to be seen. While we hope to, to, to find a way to, to help keep him in the family, keep him working to serve the citizens of Bear County like he wants to do, we just don't know what that's going to look like. And we certainly don't need the added stressor of this third party administrator refusing to do the right thing and pay for his medical bills. For Case Ed Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. Hmm. Bear County officials declined to comment for the story. You know, the denial of benefits for Deputy Rodriguez came less than two months after Bear County sued the widow of Deputy Timothy de la Fuente, and he was a deputy who died from COVID-19 complications. The county asked a judge to end the weekly death benefits that she receives and also to force her to pay back the $1,900 that it cost to cremate her husband. That suit's still pending. We also have an update tonight on those COVID-19 boosters. Moderna submitted its application for emergency authorization with the FDA. The new booster would better target Omicron strains and would be for adults age 18 and older. This comes just one day after Pfizer and BioNTech submitted its application for an updated booster. The White House hopes to make them available next month, but that will depend on the approval process. All new tonight, thieves are striking at a local university. They're after the precious metals in your catalytic converters. Police at Trinity University say they've already had three reports of the car parts stolen from parking lot Y that's near the football stadium. Those thefts have continuously happened around town as thieves try to sell those parts for money. Trinity University police say that if you buy a clamp or you etch the VIN number on the converter, that can help stop thieves. 
Crosses, flowers, teddy bears, they are planted in Uvalde's downtown plaza to honor the lives taken at Robb Elementary. That was supposed to be a temporary place, but now work is being done on a permanent memorial. The night team's Lee Waldman is live outside of the Uvalde Civic Center. So, Lee, we know the council is letting the families decide here on the memorial, right? Exactly. Tonight, the council made one thing abundantly clear. The families of the victims are the ones calling the shots on the permanent Rob Memorial. It's something they tell me they're very thankful for. It really worked with us for the first time. It was, it was a really good feeling. And they, they seem to be coming together and backing us more and more as we go. A permanent spot for our kids that we can celebrate Christmas holidays with them because we're not going to be able to do it now. They're not here with us. Well, plans for the permanent Rob Memorial in the city's downtown plaza haven't been made public yet. The victims families are all working together to create something beautiful and lasting. They had a vision and it's, it's just amazing as my brother stated. It's just, when you see it in action, you're going to appreciate the beauty of the families. City Council making it known they're here to support however the families need them to be. And I think we can, we can have something really nice that you guys want. That's what it's all about. Also approved tonight, a partnership with Safer Watch, a mobile-based security system for the city to have any suspicious activity reported directly to officials anonymously. So people are able to contribute information um, directly to city officials or to the police department, and the police department is actually able to send out real-time alerts and notify people as to what's happening in the area. That partnership with Safer Watch will last five years at only a dollar a year. Now, tomorrow marks three months since this shooting. We're planning on being back here in Uvalde tomorrow night for the school district's termination hearing for District Police Chief Pete Arredondo. We'll bring you all the latest that happens out of that meeting. Live in Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. Back here at home, a San Antonio woman is accused of threatening to shoot up a classroom in Del Rio. This comes nearly three months since the shooting in Uvalde. 32-year-old Yvette Gonzalez accused of sending those threats over the phone and through text messages. Police say her ex-boyfriend, who taught at Del Rio High School, told officers about the messages he received. After an investigation, Gonzalez was arrested here in San Antonio. So we've told you about the harassment the Bear County Elections Office is dealing with. And today, those concerns got even larger after someone shot at a window at the local Democratic Party headquarters. Now, surveillance video shows the vehicle that's suspected in that shooting. It turns out it wasn't the only storefront that was hit along Fredericksburg Road. A panaderia and a third business were also hit. The Bear County Democratic Chair says that she found unpleasant messages and also says that her volunteers are being harassed and followed. The party has seen uh, this type of act, not to this extent. There were gunshots at the Democratic headquarters last night. I, I mean, this is real. So there is an investigation, but tonight it is unclear if the Democratic Party headquarters was targeted. The clock is ticking. In 30 days, we should find out if CPS Energy has found a new leader. That's the amount of time they have to negotiate with the utility's interim CEO and president. Rudy Garza was temporarily placed into the role back in November after former president and CEO Paula Gold Williams announced her resignation. Today, CPS Energy Board voted to start the 30-day negotiation process. If it doesn't work out, the search for a new candidate will continue. Tomorrow, you can share your opinion on a problematic roadway. We're talking about Bandera Road. There is a plan to ease congestion between Loop 410 and Loop 1604. So homeowners in the area were concerned. We told you about this after a draft plan could impact their homes. But Councilwoman Ana Sandoval said that some of the aspects were taken out of that proposal. Anyway, you could attend tomorrow's meeting to learn more about it. It's happening from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. at City Church on Bandera Road. A few little showers and downpours out there right now. Uh, not all that many. We're talking a little bit in Maverick County and LaSalle and McMullen counties and even closer to San Antonio Hondo right in Medina County. That's where we have this area of heavy rain that's barely even moving, especially just south of Highway 90. And we had one shower over the past hour right along the Bear County Medina County uh, border. But this is it. Just one little downpour closer to town uh, near Hondo. This is slowly drifting off to the east southeast and I do anticipate 
anticipate a little more development through the night, and especially closer to the morning commute tomorrow. Notice I have those rain chances climbing from just isolated overnight up into the scattered category for the morning drive tomorrow, up to about 40% coverage, so widely separated. We're going to take a look at the state as a whole and how much rain has fallen recently across the drought-stricken Lone Star State, and of course, more opportunities of rain ahead to talk about. Erasing some student loan debt, that is the plan proposed from the White House. Why an economic analyst believes it could do more harm in the long run. And this just in, San Antonio police have a new lead in an arson case near downtown. Investigators now have two people that they want to talk to in the case. That story coming up next on The Night Beat. We've got an update now on an arson case near downtown. Crime Stoppers now releasing pictures of the people they're looking for in this case. This all happened back in April when firefighters responded to a vacant house on Colorado Street near Calabria that was on fire. Five hours later, another fire popped up on Laurel Street and police believe they could be connected. Investigators released the pictures of a man and woman that they want to speak to. If you know who they are, call Crime Stoppers. Their number 210-224-STOP. It was a setup. That's what the defense is arguing in the public corruption trial of former Bear County Constable Michelle Barrientes Vela. Today was day one of that testimony, which comes after more than two and a half years of delays. Barrientes Vela's attorney is arguing that the prosecutor in the case and its lead investigator set a trap for the constable and it came up empty. Meanwhile, the other side told the jury that Barrientes Vela took steps to create a false set of security payment logs. She said the constable used different pens to make it look like it was different dates and made it look like it was filled over the course of time. And that's why we're here, not on she stole money, not on she mismanaged money, not on anything that they were trying to get. We're here on a couple of documents. It is possible that dozens of witnesses could testify before this trial is over, but attorneys from both sides are not allowed to speak to the jury about other criminal accusations against Barrientes Vela. Now, testimony continues tomorrow morning, and you could watch that trial on KSAT.com, KSAT Plus, or, of course, on our YouTube channel. Now to the proposed plan to erase some student loan debt and how it could end up impacting your wallet. Sources say the White House is leaning towards canceling up to $10,000 in student loan debt. But it would depend on your income. The person would have to earn less than $125,000 a year to get that $10,000 break on their bill. Financial experts argue canceling student debt will encourage more spending impacting inflation. It's not as if this is going to lift inflation from 8% to 9%. What this is going to do is make it more difficult for us to get inflation down to 2 or 3%, which is where it really should be. It's going to make the Fed's job harder, and that means it's going to increase the risk. They're going to have to drive us into a recession to get inflation under control. But critics argue the solution to student debt is to make college more affordable in the first place. A decision on proposed debt cancellation should come as soon as tomorrow. Payments on those loans have been on hold, but they are expected to start back up again next week. All right, and now we're going to take a live look outside along the pyramid. 82 degrees right now. And for those of us who have been hoping to see the kind of rain that we saw yesterday, Adam is saying, meh. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think yesterday was our best coverage of rainfall. We still have more opportunities in the days ahead. But I think um, it's not going to be quite as good as what we had yesterday, but still at least daily chances. Take a look at those rainfall chances. I have it at 40% tomorrow's so scattered category, and that's especially for the first part of the day, including the morning commute. So something to keep in mind for the morning, check into GMSA first thing in the morning, check the weather 30 app as well. We'll have the very latest as we'll be fine tuning that forecast and then just 20 to 30% the rest of the week, all the way through the weekend and even into parts of next week. All right, so I want to show this. This is great. This is the east side of town. Three quarters of an inch of rain uh, posted to our KSAT Weather Authority app via KSAT Connect over two inches near Seguin, and that's a beautiful shot from Taylor. That's Woodlawn Lake area looking south at the thunderstorms this evening that were far south of San Antonio. So Texas, we all know, very drought stricken right now, but look at the rainfall just since Friday. This doesn't even include that tropical moisture that moved across deep south Texas last weekend. So this is just since Friday. Okay, the previous weekend we had that moisture down to the south and 
Look at the coverage and the rainfall estimates. I mean, especially East Texas. Too much of a good thing, yes. We saw all the video out of Dallas and Fort Worth area, stalled vehicles and flash flooding, too much of a good thing. But this is drought denting rain. There's no argument for that. And I do think it's going to be reflected in the newest drought monitor that comes out on Thursday. So here's a look at the latest action. LaSalle, McMullen counties. We're talking south of Fowlerton in Los Angeles here. One downpour just straddling the county line, pushing off to the east, south of Tilden. And then we talked about this earlier, just south of Hondo, drifting toward I-35 south of San Antonio. Some heavy rain here right along Highway 173, especially those of you just south of Highway 90 here in Hondo. And even the Henness area, you have some showers. But this is slowly drifting to the southeast. I anticipate a little more development late tonight and early tomorrow morning across parts of our area and you look at the bulk of the moisture that was in Texas and caused some flooding up in Dallas days ago. Now that's off to the east, moving through Mississippi and even parts of the panhandle of Florida, but we still have a bit of an active weather pattern with this stalled boundary that's in place. It's lost some of its punch, but still it's there and can help trigger some widely separated showers and even a few downpours. However, I don't anticipate flash flooding to be a big issue going forward. 90, that was the high today. Five degrees below average, the record 104, of course. We're still one day away from the all time record 100 degree days in a year and our seven day forecast keeps us below 100. Rio Medina now at 81, Bandera 79, Canyon Lake at 81, Bulverde 78. We're 80 in Uvalde and officially 82 at the airport here in San Antonio. It's very sticky. I mean, look at these dew points. Dewey's mid 70s, very muggy air in place. And often what we see in the summertime is a drop in the dew point and the humidity in the afternoon, but I don't really think that's going to be the case just with the type of atmospheric setup we have. This humidity, it's here to stay. So if you go for those long runs outdoors, bike rides or just exercise outside, even taking the dog for a walk, you're going to notice it all day, no matter what that humidity is here to stay. So tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., 75 degrees and some scattered showers, a few thunderstorms possibly impacting some parts of the morning commute. And then those rain chances fall off a bit into the afternoon. We'll be up near 90 for the high temperature. So Castroville, Divine, 91, about 87 in Bulverde and Comfort at 89. Below 100, we'll get back into the mid-90s, but as of now, we've got us still uh, below 100 for high temperatures over the next seven days. Okay, thank you, Adam. All right, Greg, the Cowboys cut another kicker as they cut down their roster. Yeah, what's interesting about this, there's an argument out there that they should have drafted a kicker, but there, a lot of teams are reluctant to do that because you find them on the waiver wire where they found a guy that they actually fired a few years ago who's back for the Cowboys now. He made the last cut, but it's not to say they can't fire him again. And the Women's Final Four Selection Committee with a visit to San Antonio for the bid to host it again. Camping with KZAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. As part of the Cowboys cut today, they get down to the 80-man roster for the final preseason game on Friday night against Seattle. Dallas drop kicker Liram Haralahu and kept former Cowboys kicker Brett Maher. That means both of the Cowboys kickers have started training camp. Jonathan Garibay out of Texas Tech and Haralahu are now gone. And today, head coach Mike McCarthy told us why. This 80 cut is, is difficult. I'm sure all teams are feeling that way today. Um, and it just, you know, it, you know you start factoring, the, you know, playing this last game, and, and you know, you know, see the other factors. So uh, we we just felt Brett was was in front, and we wanted to give him this this opportunity to to be to be the kicker, to be the guy, you know, in preseason three. So, but uh, Laram, 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 you know, we definitely gave gave him a run, and I thought he did an excellent job in this time here. We saw this coming a mile away, and even more significant, the Cowboys decided not to place wide receiver Michael Gallup recovering from knee surgery on the injured pup list at this time, meaning there is hope he may not miss the first four games right now. Now that the fall camp is in at the UTSA Roadrunners in a full countdown to kickoff mode as they're just 12 days away from their season opener against Houston in the Alamo Dome on Saturday, September the 3rd at 2.30. Now, one of the new faces you will see on the field this year is running back Traylon Smith. The Arkansas transfer will have a chance to replace Sincere McCormick, who decided to turn pro to rushing for over almost, I should say, 600 yards and five touchdowns for the Razorbacks last year. 
coming in, you know, I had to learn fast and um, I got the playbook down. I picked up everything pretty fast. So, you know, just coming in, transferring, being a new guy. Yeah, I'm the new guy, but you know, I'm ready to work. You know, I'm, I'm here to, you know, I'm a leader. I feel like I'm a leader. So I'm just here to work and uh, do my job. He'll have a smile on his face at all times. He loves to play football. He loves life. And he's just a, just a great kid to have in the locker room. And a, and a really good little bag. And the final stop of the NCAA Women's Final Four bid site visit came today as members of the selection committee visited the Alamo Dome and the Dream Court at the Eastside Boys and Girls Club. It was dedicated in 2021, the last time San Antonio hosted the big event, but unable to be seen due to the COVID restrictions. Then both UTSA and UIW women's basketball athletes conducted a clinic while the committee decides if San Antonio should receive a bid to host the Women's Final Four between 2027 and 2031. It's been terrific. The hospitality has been incredible. Um, we've gotten to see the Alamo Dome through some some different lenses this time as when we were here last time, we were only able to be on the main floor um, because of the COVID restrictions. And San Antonio has done such an incredible job for us and uh, just really impressed by the local organizing committee. All right, our big game coverage previews take us to Dombaro next. Our big game coverage previews take us to Navarro High School, which is home to the Panthers. They're ranked 10th in the state in Class 4A Division II, according to Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine, with offensive lineman Mac Berry on their preseason All-State list. Head coach Ron Blunt is bringing back 12 starters, 5 on offense, 7 on defense. They went 10-3 and three last year. He's ranked 5th in 12's Top 12, led by linebacker Hayden Tolliver with 143 tackles and 6 sacks. We have a, a lot of returning starters on our defense, and I think our defense is going to be the strength of our team. Um, I also think that the leadership is going to be there and that we're, we're a better bonded team this year than we were last year, so hopefully that equates to more success. We do have a pretty good uh, lineup, but especially Wimberley and Quero, they're, uh, they're a good team, they're a good program, but we're coming for them this year. All right, Navarro will kick off their season in Navasota this Friday night at 7 o'clock. District play begins tonight in high school volleyball. Some great matchups in District 28-6A. Reagan taking on Clark, Paul Taylor Fieldhouse. This one goes five sets. Early in the fifth, Katie Hill picks the far corner with a spike. Rattlers trail 5-4, but Clark counters with a 5-0 run. Caitlin Whitlock throws it down to the net to cap the rally. Cougars win the fifth set 15-7, take the thriller three sets to two. Also in District 28-6A, great matchup between Madison and Churchill. Mavericks up two sets to one in control of the fourth. Aubrey Lissy here gets the dump shot to fall for a one-point Madison lead. Churchill answers back. Sakari McNeil goes off speed with a push shot. It drops 2019 charges, but the Mavericks rally late. Jaden Jones hammers one down the line, gets the call. Madison takes a fourth set, 25-23. They win the match three sets to one. Let's hop in the pool now for some water polo tonight. Alamo Heights hosting Brandeis and a doubleheader. Girls in the fir water first here. Back and forth match late in the second period. Cameron Flannery fires it past the goalkeeper. Tied up at six, heading into halftime. We're still tied at eight all in the fourth period until the Broncos pull away. Reeves Sanchez gets a clean look, buries a shot in the back of the net. Brandeis wins 12-8. The boys then jump in next. Broncos trailing 2-0 early, but rallying pass back out to Jason Manzo. He sneaks a shot inside the post to cut the deficit in half, but the Mules answer back. Check out the quick shot here from EJ Gonzalez, rifling it past the keeper. Mules headed to halftime, leading 4-2. They win it 7-4. More local sports highlights later tonight. BGC page at KSAT.com. False Sports in full swing. You were looking good, huh? Thanks, Greg. Right, good stuff. We'll be right back. After all right, Greg showed us water polo in sports. Take a look at this. This rugby competition was taken to the waters of Switzerland. More than 20 teams took part in the touch rugby tournament, all playing on the floating field in Lake Geneva this weekend. The event honors the 50th anniversary of a Swiss rugby club. As you can see, some participants clearly did not mind getting wet. I would think that'd be the highlight you'd be up for. It'd be weird if you were playing and you were like, oh, no. I Don't wonder how well cold the water is there. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Looks like fun, though. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Don't forget that Good Morning San Antonio starts at 430. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow. Great.